Chapter 10. Killer Men Come Shortly after this, the rains came and forced us to shelter for days on end inside the cave house. The tracks became torrents, the forest became swamp. I longed for the howl of the gibbons instead of the roar of the rain on the trees outside. It did not rain in fits and starts as it did at home, but constantly, incessantly. I worried over our beacon that was becoming more saturated now with every passing day. Would it ever dry out? Would this rain ever stop? But Kinsuki was stoical about it all. It stopped when it stopped, Makasan, he told me. You cannot make rain you cannot make rain stop by wanting it to stop. Besides, rain very good thing. Keep fruit growing, keep stream flowing, keep monkeys alive. You also, me also. I did make a dash up to the hilltop each morning with the binoculars, but I don't know why I bothered. Sometimes it was raining so hard I could hardly see the sea at all. Occasionally, we sallied out into the forest to gather enough fruit to keep us going. There were berries growing in abundance now, which Kensuke insisted on gathering. He didn't seem to mind getting soaked to the skin as much as I did. We ate some, but most he turned into vinegar. The rest he bottled in honey and water. A rainy day, yes? He laughed. He loved experimenting with the new expressions he had picked up. We ate a lot of smoked fish. He always seemed to have enough in reserve. It made me very thirsty, but I never tired of it. I remember the rainy season more for the painting we did than for anything else. We painted together for hours on end, until the octopus ink ran out. These days, Kensuke was painting more from his memory. His house in Nagasaki and several portraits of Kimi and Michi are standing together, always under the, cherry, under the cherry tree. The faces, I noticed, he always left very indistinct. He once explained this to me. He was more and more fluent now in his English. I remember who they are, he said. I remember where they are. I can hear them in my head, but I cannot see them. I spent days perfecting my first attempt at an orangutan. It was of Tomodachi. She would often crouch soulful and dripping at the cave mouth, almost as if she was posing for me. So I took full advantage. Kensuke was ecstatic in his delight at my painting and lavish in his praise. One day, Makasan, you will be fine painter, like Hokusai maybe. That was the first shell painting of mine he kept and stored away in his chest. I felt so proud. After that, he insisted on keeping many of my shell paintings. He would often take them out of the chest and study them carefully, showing me where I might improve, but always generously. Under his watchful eye, in the glow of his encouragement, every picture I painted seemed more accomplished, more how I wanted it to be. Then one morning, the gibbons were howling again and the rain stopped. We went fishing in the shallows, out at sea too, and had very soon replenished our stores of smoked fish and octopus ink. We played football again, and all the while the beacon on the hilltop was drying out. Wherever we went now, we took the binoculars with us, just in case. We very nearly lost them once when Kikambo, Tomodachi's errant son, always the cheekiest, most playful of the young orangutans, stole them and ran off into the forest. When we caught up with them, he didn't want to surrender them at all. In the end, Kensugi had to bribe him a red banana for a pair of binoculars. But as time passed, we were beginning to live, live as if we were going to be staying on the island forever, and that began to trouble me deeply. Kensuke made repairs to his outrig outrigger. He made more vinegar. He collected herbs and dried them in the sun, and he seemed less and less interested in looking for a ship. He seemed to have forgotten all about it. He sensed my restlessness. He was working on the boat one day, and ever hopeful, I was scanning through the sea through the binoculars. It is easier when you are old like me, Makasan, he said. What is, he asked. Waiting, he said. One day a ship will come, Makasan. Maybe soon, maybe not soon, but it will come. Life not be spent always hoping, always waiting. Life is for living. I knew he was right, of course, but only when I was lost and absorbed in my painting was I truly able to obliterate all thoughts of rescue, all thoughts of my mother and father. I woke one morning and Stella was barking outside the cave house. I got up and went out after her. At first she was nowhere to be seen. When I did find her, she was high up on the hill, half growling, half barking, and her hackles were up. I soon saw why. A junk. A small junk far out to sea. I scrambled down the hill and met Ken Sukingham out of the cave house, buckling his belt. There's a boat, I cried. The fire. Let's light the fire. First, I look, said Ken Suki. And despite all my protestations, he went back into the cave house for his binoculars. I raced up the hill again. The junk was close enough to shore. They would be bound to see the smoke. I was sure of it. 
and Suki was making his way up towards me infuriatingly slowly. He seemed to be in no hurry at all. He studied the boat carefully now through his binoculars, taking his time about it. We've got to light the fire, I said. We've got to. Kensuke caught me suddenly by the arm. The arm. It is the same boat, Makasan. Killer men come. They kill the gibbons and steal away the babies. They come back again. I am very sure. I do not forget the boat. I never forget. They are very wicked people. We must go quick. We must find all orangutans. We must bring them into the cave. They be safe there. It did not take him long to gather them in. As we walked in the, to the forest, Kensuke simply began to sing. They materialised out of nowhere in twos and threes until we had fifteen of them. Four were still missing. We went deeper and deeper into the forest to find them, Kensuke singing all the while. Then three more came crashing through the trees, Tomodachi amongst them, only one still missing, Kikambo. Standing there in a clearing in the forest, surrounded by the orangutans, Kensuke sang for Kikambo again and again, but he did not come. Then we heard a motor start up, somewhere out at sea, an outboard motor. Kensuke sang out again, louder now, more urgently. We listened for Kikambo. We looked for him. We called for him. We cannot wait any longer, said Kensuke at last. I go in front, Mikasa, and you behind. Bring last ones with you, quick now. And off he went up the track, leading one of the orangutans by the hand and still singing. As we followed, I remember thinking that this was just like the Pied Piper leading the children away into a cave in the mountainside. I had my work cut out at the back. Some of the younger orangutans were far more interested in playing hide and seek than following. In the end, I had to scoop up two of them and carry them, one in the crook of each arm. They were a great deal heavier than they looked. I kept glancing back over my shoulder for kicking bow and calling for him, but he still did not come. The outboard motor died. I heard voices. Loud voices, men's voices, laughter. I was running now, the orangutans clinging round my neck. The forest hooted and howled in alarm all around me. At first I reached the cave. As I reached the cave, I heard the first shots ring out. Every bird, every bat in the forest lifted off so that the screeching sky was black with them. We gathered the orangutans together at the back of the cave and huddled there in the darkness with them as the shooting went on and on. Of all of them, Tomodachi was the most agitated, but they all needed constant comfort and reassurance from Kensuke. All through this dreadful nightmare, Kensuke sang to them softly. The hunters were nearer, ever nearer, shooting and shouting. I closed my eyes. I prayed. The orangutans whimpered aloud as if they were singing along with Kensuke. All this while Stella lay at my feet, a permanent growl in her throat. I held onto the ruff of her neck just in case. The young orangutans bowed their heads into me wherever they could, under my arms, under my knees, and clung on. The shots cracked so close now, splitting the air and echoing round the cave. There were distant yells of triumph. I knew only too well what this must mean. After that, the hunt moved away. We could hear no more voices, just the occasional shot. And then, nothing. The forest had fallen silent. We stayed where we were for hours. I wanted to venture out to see if they had gone, but Kensuke would not let me. He sang all the time, and the orangutans stayed huddled around us until we heard the sound of the outboard motor starting up. Even then, Kensuke still made me wait a while longer. When at last we did emerge, the junk was already well out to sea. We searched the island for Kikambo, sang for him, called for him, but there was no sign of him. Kensuke was in deep despair. He was inconsolable. He went off on his own, and I let him go. I came across him shortly after, kneeling over the bodies of two dead gibbons, both mothers. He was not crying, but he had been. His eyes were filled with hurt and bewilderment. We dug away a hole in the soft earth on the edge of the forest and buried them. There were no words in me left to speak, and Kensuke had no songs left to sing. We were making our sorrowful way back home, along the beach when it happened. Kikambo ambushed us. He came charging out of the trees, scattering sand at us, and then climbed up Kentucky's leg and wrapped himself around his neck. It was such a good moment, a great moment. That night, Kensuke and I sang ten green bottles over and over again, very loudly over our fish soup. It was, I suppose, a sort of wake for the two dead gibbons, as well as an ode to joy for Kikambo. The forest outside seemed to echo our singing. 
but in the weeks that followed, I could see that Kensuke was brooding on the terrible events of that day. He set about making a cage of stout bamboo at the back of the cage to house the orangutans more securely, in case the killer men ever returned. He kept going over and over it, how he should have done this before, how he would never have forgiven himself if Kikambo had been taken, how he wished the Gibbons would come when he sang, so he could save them too. We cut down branches and brush from the forest and stacked them outside the cave mouth so that they could be pulled across to disguise the entrance to the cave.